So speaking of younger people, you've written a couple of books with, um, or is it just the one book with your son with Fred? Fred. What was yes. That like? Well, that was a very interesting experience. Uh, <clears throat> it was Fred's idea. Okay. Fred very much wanted to write the book we wrote. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thought it was necessary for. We were going to wake up to the country, the country to the danger of our foolish defense policy. Okay. Uh, at the very least, we, we wrote it with the intention of coming out in time for the 2000 election. Okay. Because one thing was clear, neither candidate wanted to talk about it at all. Okay. And so maybe we, could, we failed totally. We, we did not influence anything. <clears throat> okay. Uh, all kinds of reasons that the thing books sank to the bottom of the ocean, but but uh, it was uh, it was interesting. It's the kind of thing I, you know, I sometimes like to do. In a way, it's an extension of the origins of war kind of a book, uh, and it got me to look at some modern history that I really hadn't looked at before. We divided up our chores to suit each other, uh, others' uh, abilities and interests. Uh, but but for instance, uh, I had never really looked. At the uh, the Greek the Greco-Turkish War that broke out in uh, what 1921 I think it was yeah I think it went from 21 to 23 something like that but <clears throat> actually I was much more interested that was part of it but I was much more interested in why it was interesting was because it was the first challenge that I could think of to Britain in terms of how the British would handle trouble after the Great War. And that was the thing. I don't know if this rings a bell for you, the Chanak affair. Yeah, right. That's what I was really writing about. And, uh, and, the, and one sees, I mean, in retrospect, it was not a surprise, <clears throat> the British were just living in, in a la-la land. They just would not understand. They, they were so shattered, so beaten down, so hurt by the terrible things that had happened to them in the war everything totally understandable, that in their hearts, they really were not ready to use force. But they hadn't surrendered yet. They were still the greatest power in the world, it was thought. Uh, <clears throat> they still had all these interests. And so the pressure sometimes would, and, and then the British had the sense that they were the great power in the world. So the people, insofar as they became engaged, expected their government sometimes to do things. Or people thought they might. And, and so, of course, meanwhile, they were busily getting disarmed as fast as they possibly could and becoming less and less capable of doing it. And all of this had ramifications, you know, it was reverberating about what was going on with us. You know, the Cold War was over, we don't need any army anymore. That was essentially the situation we were coping with. So it, I, felt, I felt engaged by the relevance of what I was doing. But I was also very, very interested in the particulars. It allowed me to become a little bit less ignorant about a number of things. And a good deal of what I had to write about was the American, because we had two parts. The first was to look at the British in the 20s, okay. and then was to look at the Americans now okay. in the Clinton administration. And I was you know, so appalled by what I discovered. But I didn't convince anybody. Uh, I, I like to ask a question that my son sent for this particular occasion. He Shoot. says, uh, you've always been passionate about sports. Right. As a participant, a fan, and even acting athletic director at Yale. How did you tie that into your scholarship, your teaching, and your mentoring? I regret to say, not at all. That's what I told him. <laughs> no, that's not. I've heard stories not true. of yeah. you playing football games. TD or Sullivan, which were you? Both. Both, yes. I heard tell of football well, what games is, with students. What has that got to do with my teaching? Mentoring, and I, mentoring was part of the question. Oh, no, I carefully didn't mentor anybody. Oh, okay. I okay. did not. I did not. Tackle did not mentor. <laughs> no, that's right. I did not. I definitely never coached. I never. Okay. okay. And in fact, when I became master at TD, but, and I returned to the football fields, <clears throat> I carefully got somebody else to be the coach. Because mm. I, I didn't want to be in that role. Really? I, I wanted to be in the role of player. Okay, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, no, I, 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 
I, I just play because I love football. Right. Right. There's nothing else to say. I think I, I have one final question. Do you have any more, Kate? No. We asked you what your favorite book was. What, of what scholarly achievement are you most proud? I think it's, it's the same. It's, that, it, it, it's, the same. it's the history of that four volume thing. I think that was, that was the best thing I could have done with my time. And I'm pretty satisfied with it. What was the best day of your life? If you're not going to answer that one, I'll give you another. <laughs> I, I just don't know if I could even contemplate such a... I, I have led such a lucky, charmed life that I feel like almost every day is the best day of my life. I mean, I, it's not a decent answer to your question. For me, it, for me, it was the day I saw my daughter born, my first child. I, yeah, I mean, it's that, that kind was, of thing. That, that sort of... It wasn't so with me. I was uh, very dubious about being a father. <clears throat> uh, it was no, one I, of my, I couldn't wait. Well, you were right. I, I, I was completely stupid on my part. When I look at my life and I think of the incredible richness that was brought to me by my children and how much poorer I would be if I didn't have them, I can only conclude I, I am as stupid as I often seem. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's just fantastic. But uh, I didn't appreciate it at the time. <clears throat> can I ask, why were you dubious? about this notion? It seemed to me that children are a big bother. They get in your way. There's all kinds of things you can't do. Right. They take up your wife's attention. Right. There's mm -hmm. endless, yes. endless negatives. What do you get out of it? <laughs> I, and I really had, didn't have a good idea what you get out of it. Oh. And I, 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 it's, it's incredible to me now I mean, how, how tremendously important and rewarding it was. And the worst day of your life? See, what we saved the hard ones up to last. <laughs> this sounds ridiculous, and I'm probably not thinking straight, but the day the, the Cornell faculty shamelessly surrendered to threats in that... Uh, yes, because that was the end of paradise. You remember earlier on in the conversation you said that was as close to paradise as you could remember. Right. So that was the end of par paradise lost, it as Kate might say. No, it, ab it absolutely, and, and you see, I, you know, on top of that, I, I felt like I was a tremendous fool. I really did, because I had, without knowing it, but I had idealized both the life and the character of professors. <clears throat> I never thought about the ones that were in inadequate or inappropriate, but I thought about the ones I admired. And, all I had. and they were the finest people I had ever known or heard of or seen. I admired them enormously. And even so, I, in my general picture was that they were better than the ordinary folks because they, were, they knew what was going on, they understood, they were intelligent. But they were people, I thought, with principle, who clearly understood there was right and wrong. And, they, and, uh, and I had this idealistic picture of them. And what I saw gradually over time made me think they were in many ways among the worst people I had ever met. And I had been so stupid as to be taken in and misled in that way. So I think, you know, I think that really was probably the worst day of my life when all of my dreams were shattered. <clears throat> the only thing that saved me was there was this small collection of good men who stood firm at that time. I can't tell you how important they were to me. I, I just one more anecdote. Just uh, so this terrible day happened, and I was as shattered as I could be. Of course, Myrna was of, of what the same mind as me. We were in share all this. So I, we said we can't stay in this town. We got to get out of town. So we'll go to New York. We'll stay in a hotel until we can recover. And, so on. Well, this, what happens, that's the day the faculty folded. We go to New York, we're in the hotel, spend the night, next morning, pick up the New York Times, front page. 
our friends, the key guys, resigned from Cornell. And my heart soared. And we immediately had to jump in the car and go home. We had to be with them. And they, they, were, they were extraordinarily fine, extraordinary men. Uh, but it, to see that... Yeah, that, is, that, that is a very courageous thing to do. A handful of guys. And the wonderful thing that made it so special, I mean, that was enough, but was that their, their politics were not the same. That was the best part of it. Walter Burns was a hard-shell conservative. He announced, announced, there weren't five of them. Walter Burns was one of those. <clears throat> Alan Sindler was a liberal Democrat <clears throat> and had been, a, he had been teaching in the South. He had been on freedom rides. You know, he'd been a really serious liberal. He's, and he's, in his view, he still was. <clears throat> Walter Lefebvre was, he, yeah, he didn't quit yet, uh, Cornell, but he quit the chairmanship. And I didn't care if he, I didn't want him to leave Cornell. I wanted him to come out publicly and say, this is bad, you know. And Walter did. Walter is a socialist. And <clears throat> I, 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 it made it all, I mean, it was, but we, we were not playing politics. We were reacting morally to what we thought was a disgraceful behavior. An extraordinary roller coaster. It was amazing. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was the worst day. In, in a way, that was the worst day followed by the best day. In a way, that's right. The best day was when you opened the paper and you found that you weren't alone. No, or you and Myrna were not alone. No, and 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 the, it was better than we, we we had known because we had all signed this paper and all that. Walter and all these guys had signed the paper, but that they had. You know, gone public. Right. Right. That they had gone beyond what, what decency and goodness required. Courage was now there, and that is so rare right. that you you you're blown away. And that takes you back to your first discovery of the Greeks, because one of the things you said you admired there was they were courageous. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I I know how hard it is to be courageous because. I'm very often not courageous, and so <clears throat> it's not what we've seen. Well, but in no way, I mean, I know it's not easy, and and so when I see it and it's on the right side, you know, I admire it enormously. What are you going to say? Was it was there something in your childhood that I mean, it's almost a tale of you know good versus evil, you know. Mm -hmm. The That's way it looks to me. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, was there something? I mean, I remember being drawn to you know tales of chivalry. When I was growing up, yes. I mean, were you? <clears throat> no, but I, I think it, I can't answer your question satisfactorily. But <clears throat> growing up in Brownsville, when I did, <clears throat> you you know, street kids, nobody saw their families much at all. I hardly ever. My mother was either working or she was sleeping or something. I would. My life was on the streets with the other kids. <clears throat> And somehow, when, when, when kids are by themselves, without adult supervision, in some way or other, your courage is tested very frequently. Kids do things to each other or threaten mm -hmm. each other or whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> boys, that's very especially true of boys, I think. And so I, su I suppose that rose in my horizon of perception very high. Is this guy a coward, or has he got the stuff? Hmm. Would be something I would readily think about, and I, and worrying about myself, and worrying about how will I behave if I see some trouble coming up, and how would I behave if this happened? I was always conscious of worrying about myself and worrying if I would match up to what I hoped my standards should be. And that wasn't religiously inflected for you. That was more of a religion had no place in our life. We did. We didn't ask you that, but um, religion had had and has no place in my life. Because parallel to this struggle on the streets of Brownsville, you also have. I mean, you were born in 1932. You're growing up with the biggest fight between good and evil that I have seen in my lifetime. I'm sure. younger than you, and you must have been conscious as the evidence came out that that 
there are courageous men and women in this world. You, you, you know, I hadn't thought about it, but you're totally right. I was, at a very early age, aware not only of Hitler, and no, no Jews were not aware of right. Hitler, but, <clears throat> but I was aware there was a Churchill. And I was even, even though I don't know why I knew this, but I was aware there was a Chamberlain. And you want to talk about good and evil, that was, that was it for me. You didn't have to know much more than that. And one reason why I thought that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was appointed president by God was because he was on the side of stopping Hitler. Yes, you're absolutely right. That was the, by far the number one And the more thing. that came out, the more you realize that, that, that courage was what was required. Yes, yes. It's a... Uh, I'm sorry. No, you go. I didn't mean no, to no, interrupt. No, no, I was just going to... I mean, did the Soviet take over of the Baltics have anything to do with this as well? I mean, being... Uh, we weren't much tuned... Or just wasn't... We were much tuned into that. We were not okay. much tuned into that. It okay. didn't really play for us. Um, also, you're, you're a little younger. You, you're, you're only... I'm nine, only eight years old. Eight, eight nine. Yeah, that's right. It, it's yeah. 40, 39, 40. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think a another thing was, you know, Hitler was so blatantly and completely the devil, right. and our particular devil especially, right. that he blotted everything else out. And my, the people, few people I knew who knew anything about these things <clears throat> tended to be leftists. Nobody was yelling at Stalin. In those neighborhoods, so we wouldn't have heard very much about it. Right. And then you know the whole, the whole sort of respectable press was busily buying all those lies about the Soviet Union anyway. So we, you weren't, we weren't getting that story very well. Is what I'm trying to say. Right. And it was all blotted out. You know, we used to listen. I remember this when I was a really small kid. We used to listen to Hitler's speeches on the radio. He would be talking German. <clears throat> and we would be, I didn't know what he was saying, but he sounded scary as hell. Hmm. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to communicate a sense of the uh, reality. Yeah. That we well, why were you listening if you didn't understand German? Presumably a lot of your community would in fact have been German I have, speakers. I have to believe that, this, I, my memory is this is in my grandmother's house. Hmm. And of course, Yiddish was their native language. How much German you knew if you were brought up in Lithuania speaking Yiddish, I don't know. But the answer is maybe some. Was she from Vilnius? I mean, we, no, we, no, we were from the from uh, Kaunas, from that. Okay, so there's a big German community there. Oh, I mean, there's these well, we, German we, German. They Amazon. lived in a village, in oh, a oh, little okay. village. Right, right. So probably not. And so they probably they they didn't know German. On the other hand, <clears throat> uh, my mother, who of course knew Yiddish. Didn't know she knew German, but sometimes she did, if you know right. what I mean. But, yeah. but I don't think, she I don't know why they were listening to it, because there wasn't anybody really knew German. Except it's frightening. And, and uh, yeah. I, I remember J.H. Plummer, who was my mentor, saying that he realized that, that, that you know, shit was going to happen, <laughs> as they say. You know, anybody um, who sounded like that, it didn't matter what he said. He, mm. he can't, have you ever heard any of those things? Yeah. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, he just sounds like a frightening demagogue. Yeah, yeah. 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 And even more frightening on the radio. Where you can hear the crowd and you can't see. Yes, and the yeah. chanting. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. It was it was very very scary, yeah. but I, I had faith. I really did as my little kid. Franklin Roosevelt was going to take care of us. Yeah, I don't think you were not alone in that. <laughs> and he, he, you know, whatever you say about Roosevelt, <laughs> in a way he did. Yes. No, and whatever you say about Roosevelt, I think it's a, quite a mixed bag. But Jesus, he deserves incredible marks for getting the country to do what it did, because boy, it wasn't easy. <laughs> I mean, I always remember, it's helpful to remember, Kingman Brewster, as an undergraduate, was a member of America First, and arguing against our getting involved. Yes, when the war came, he served nobly in the United States Navy, and I'm sure was a very fine sailor. But the fact is, back then, that was not what uh, people were thinking about. <clears throat> so, uh, there you were. Say, you know, we've, we've really abused your patience. Terrible. I want to record. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's just been wonderful. I'm going to turn off now. Uh, it's October, still October the 19th, <laughs> 2012, and this is still Don Kagan going strong after nearly four hours of torture. Thank you so much.